Today we're really very pleased to have a very, very interesting hot topic uh, that you'll hear more about. Um, today's moderator is going to be Jeff Olin. He's professor of medicine, director of vascular medicine uh, in the Icon School of Medicine here at Mount Sinai. The other panelists that we'll have on this topic of submassive pulmonary embolism are Dr. Lou DiPaolo, who's the Sarah and Eric Lane Professor of Pulmonary Medicine, Clinical Director, Mount Sinai uh, National Jewish Health Respiratory Institute Collaboration, and Chairman of the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee here at Mount Sinai, Dr. Lukstein, Robert Lukstein, who's Professor of Radiology and Surgery in Division of Vascular and Interventional Radiology, and Ramach Khandra Reddy, who's Associate Professor of Cardiovascular Surgery here at Sinai, and our fellow who's going to be on the panel is Rabba Kalina um, from Mount Sinai Heart. Um, the topic of submassive pulmonary embolism is very interesting. It's a new area of uh, great excitement from a therapeutic and intervention point of view. We're going to hear more about it from our fellow, Robert Kalina. I just want to thank everybody for coming, particularly Dr. Goldhaber. So pulmonary embolism is a common and potentially fatal phenomenon. The incidence of PE in the general population is estimated to be approximately 60 to 70 per 100,000. Venous thromboembolism, including PE and DVT, is the third most common cause of death from cardiovascular disease after myocardial infarction and stroke. Morbidity and mortality associated with pulmonary embolism is significant. The International Cooperative Pulmonary Embolism Registry, ICOPR, reported an 11% all-cause mortality in the first two weeks and a 15% mortality at three months. Patients who survive the acute event are at risk for recurrent PE and other sequelae, such as chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure. Submassive pulmonary embolism, defined as pulmonary embolism causing right heart dysfunction without hemodynamic instability, poses significant therapeutic challenges. Currently, treatment guidelines recommend anticoagulation in un with unpressurated heparin or low molecular weight heparin in the acute setting, followed by at least three to six months of anticoagulant therapy, which may include vitamin K antagonists or novel oral anticoagulants. However, the role of advanced therapies such as fibrinolysis, catheter-directed therapies, and surgery has been difficult to determine. While there is general agreement that PE with hemodynamic compromise, termed massive pulmonary embolism, can be treated with fibrinolysis, the risk-benefit ratio of using thrombolytics in patients with submassive PE is less clear. Although fibrinolysis can improve pulmonary perfusion and right heart function more rapidly than anticoagulation alone, the risk of fatal bleeding prevents routine use. Intracranial hemorrhage, the most feared complication, has been found to occur in 1.4 to 3 percent of patients, with higher rates in those who are elderly or have com multiple comorbidities. A recent meta-analysis showed that major bleeding, including extracranial bleeds, occurred in 9 percent of patients receiving thrombolytics, with individual studies showing rates as high as 21 percent. Until recently, there were few patients enrolled in randomized control trials evaluating the role of fibrinolysis in patients with submassive PE. In 2014, results of the PTHO and TopCoat top trials were published more than doubling the total number of patients studied with acute submassive pulmonary embolism. A meta-analysis including these newer studies synthesized the results of all major trials. The meta-analysis concluded that thrombolytic therapy significantly decreased the rate of clinical deterioration, but not all-cause mortality or recurrent PE when compared with heparin alone. Major bleeding trended toward a higher rate in the thrombolytic group, but was not statistically significant. As expected, there were significantly higher rates of intracranial hemorrhage in those who received thrombolytics compared with those who did not, 1.7 versus 0.1 percent, respectively. Therefore, the lack of mortality benefit with the use of thrombolytic therapy paired with an increased risk of fatal intracranial hemorrhage suggests that caution must be used when administering fibrinolytics for submassive PE. However, in the appropriate patient, thrombolytics reduce the risk of short-term clinical deterioration and may reduce long-term morbidity. Newer techniques, such as catheter-directed therapies, are an emerging and promising area of therapy. Either mechanical or pharmacomechanical catheter-directed therapies can be utilized. A randomized study published in 2014 showed that in patients who receive catheter-directed therapy, 
RV systolic function was significantly improved after 24 and 90 days when compared with those who received anticoagulation alone. Although not adequately powered for mortality, no difference was detected between the two groups. The PERFECT study, a prospective multicenter registry of patients who received catheter-directed therapy, showed that clinical success, which they defined as stabilization of hemodynamics, improvement in pulmonary hypertension, and survival to hospital discharge, occurred in 85 percent of patients with massive PE and 97 percent of patients with submassive PE. There were no hemorrhagic strokes or major hemorrhages. Therefore, these procedures may be a potential safe and effective alternative to standard therapy. For patients who are not candidates for fibrolytic therapy, surgical pulmonary embolectomy may be another option. Indications for this procedure include massive PE and failure of medical therapy. In recent years, mortality from the procedure has improved, but is still quoted to be approximately 20 percent. Recent data in patients with massive proximal PE suggests that early surgical intervention may lead to improved long-term survival compared to medical therapy with thrombolytics. However, data in hemodynamically sta stable patients are lacking. IVC filters are indicated for patients with PE with a contraindication to anticoagulation, but their use in conjunction with anticoagulation is controversial. Initial randomized studies with IVC filters plus anticoagulation versus anticoagulation alone demonstrated a reduction in the recurrence of PE at the expense of increased risk of DVT. However, a more recent trial called PREPIC-2 showed no difference in the recurrence of PE, DVT, or mortality between the, the group that received retrievable IVC filters versus controlled. Therefore, the benefit of IVC filter use in conjunction with anticoagulation in patients with PE is unclear. So which patients with submassive PE may benefit from thrombolysis and other advanced therapies? Risk stratification is one potential tool that can help determine the answer to this question. Imaging, including echocardiography and computer tomography, as well as biomarkers such as troponin, brain natriuretic peptide, and heart type fatty acid binding proteins have been useful in identifying patients who are high risk for adverse events. At this time, guidelines suggest that clinicians should use a combination of these tools to identify higher risk patients but recommend that thrombolytics should only be administered to those which, to which clinical deterioration appears imminent. In summary, although there have been significant advances in clinical knowledge regarding the management of submassive PE, questions still remain. Further assessment of risk stratification tools are warranted and may allow for this phenomenon to be treated in a more algorithmic fashion in the future. When considering fibrinolysis and other advanced therapies for submassive PE, bleeding risk, patient preference, and hemodynamic parameters should be incorporated into decision-making. When possible, a multidisciplinary team of experts should evaluate each individual case in order to maximize favorable outcomes and to minimize risk. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Robert, for a beautiful summary of a very <clears throat> interesting, frequent, and complex subject. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce today uh, a real gentleman with a fantastic judgment. And this is Dr. Samuel Goldhaber. Just to point out who is he, so let me start by saying that he's professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, a senior staff member of the Brigham and Women's Hospitals. He's director of the Thrombosis Research medical co-director of the Anticoagulation Management Service, and since last Tuesday, he is the new head of vascular medicine at the Brigham. So let me, let me just uh, be more specific. Uh, Dr. Goldhaber was born in New York City, and uh, from the very beginning, uh, he became attached to Boston, uh, Harvard College, Harvard Medical School, medical house officer, chief medical resident at the Brigham, cardiology clinical fellow, cardiology research fellow, instructor of medicine, 2005 professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and with all the titles I mentioned to you uh, at the Brigham. Now, um, as I said, he's uh, one of the people that you encounter in your professional career that, that has an impact on you, and, said, uh, and certainly he had a tremendous impact on me 
on many, many encounters, uh, whether these were uh, meetings or whether he, he is running a, a video in a number of uh, national meetings where I met him and I was always very, very impressed. This is not surprising that he belongs to so many committees, uh, committees that are local, committees that are national uh, at the AHA, ACC, NIH, international, among the national committees, he's president and funding director of the North American Thrombosis, uh, uh, um, thrombosis Enterprise. He uh, really has been a tremendous contributor in many, many ways. Um, he has been recognized by being in the editorial board of 13 premier journals in the cardiovascular field. And he got a number of honors and prizes since he was in college in Harvard Medical School, then at the Brigham. But what really points, what I would like to point out is what a fantastic uh, educator he is. Uh, he has been always chosen in the medical school at Harvard, graduate, postgraduate education. He has mentored a large number of people in the, in the vascular field. And, and, and certainly, um, he has been in multiple programs, uh, national and international. In addition, he's a great educator at the community, so he's not only in our professional side, but he goes beyond. Now, he, um, uh, Dr. Goldhaber, uh, has uh, a good pedigree in terms of grants uh, from NIH, uh, presently three grants and many more before. And he's actually, in a way, co-investigator, PI, or, or, in the, or in the board, in one of the boards of, uh, of um, about nine different trials that are ongoing at the present time. And one of the most important ones is uh, he's part of the Garfield uh, Venus Thromboembolism Registry, which I believe is based in London, and he's the one who is... Uh, really coordinating uh, the, the group at the United States. Well, having said that, I think his major uh, driving force has been in the area of thrombosis, venous thromboembolism, anticoagulant therapy, and certainly uh, pulmonary embolism. Uh, he's the person who always comes to mind. Uh, two people came, came to mind since I was in medical school one is, was Dr. Caker, uh, who was really a pioneer from London, and then Dr. Goldhaber. And these are the two people that you always think about when you talk about thromboembolism in the sense of uh, pulmonary emboli. He has about uh, um, uh, close to 300 paper in, papers in top peer reviewed journals about vascular disease, thrombosis, and antithrombotic therapy. His main focus has been in pulmonary emboli. And he has been extremely productive in many, many areas, books that he has written about it, and a number of uh, uh, very much um, articles that really put you up to date on the subject. And certainly it's a pleasure to have you here today, Samuel, um, visiting Mount Sinai, I guess for the second time. And I'd like to give you this plaque. I'm not sure it has changed the format of the plaque, as you came previously. But, uh, this is just to express appreciation to you for outstanding teaching, wisdom, and expertise as the Anandi Sharma visiting professor in the Simon Duck Memorial Lecture. Well, thank you it's very much, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to serve you here. Thank you. So what I'm going to do then, I, I'm going to call uh, Jeff Wallin. Uh, it's nice you gave me a vacation, Jeff, today. I can sit here relax, no problems, just listening to what you people are going to discuss. And then I'm going to ask the uh, other members of the panel, Lou De Paolo, uh, Robert Lutstein, and Ramachandra Sredi, and, and of course, uh, Robert Kulina. All right, so. Thank you, Robert. That was a very nice summary of the issues at hand here. And what we're here to discuss today predominantly is how we take care of patients with submassive PE. But before we do that, 
I just want to just spend a minute or two on massive pulmonary embolism. So, Robert, you, um, you have a patient with massive pulmonary embolism, and they're hemodynamically unstable. And what are you going to recommend as far as treatment for them? I think the evidence shows that thrombolysis in this case, as well as pulmonary embolectomy, are both are two options uh, that have been proven to improve mortality. So, I'm going to, Sam, I'm going to ask you, has there ever been a study demonstrating a mortality benefit in massive pulmonary embolism? I think from the ICAPR registry, you showed no mortality benefit. <clears throat> there was an eight-patient study, and the um, principal investigator is Carlos Herges from Mexico. And uh, I know Carlos and his wife, Alicia, they're both double-boarded in cardiology and in pulmonary medicine, and I've known them for several decades. So they started a randomized controlled trial of thrombolysis versus anticoagulation in massive pulmonary embolism, and uh, Carlos phoned me after the first eight patients were enrolled in this randomized trial because all four patients who were randomized to anticoagulation uh, died, and all four who received thrombolytic therapy survived. And he asked me, what did I suggest he do? By the way, if you do the, the p-value on that, uh, it's less than 0.05. Um, and and I, I gave it some thought. I said, you know, it was up to him. He was going to have a 40-patient trial. And I said I thought he should probably stop the trial at that point and publish the results, which he did. He published in the Journal of uh, Thrombosis and Thrombolysis. And as far as I know, Jeff, that's the only uh, randomized controlled trial of thrombolysis and massive pulmonary embolism. So, so what do we do in a situation like this? Do we refer to the cardiac surgeon? Ram, what do you think should be done with these patients? And can you tell us what the mortality rate is in patients who undergo surgery for massive pulmonary embolism? I think a couple of things. With massive pulmonary embolism now, if a patient is hemodynamically unstable, at that point, the clock accelerates at that point. So you have to stabilize the patient hemodynamically, whatever it takes. Surgical pulmonary embolectomy does that very quickly because you put them on the heart-lung machine and you, you stop the clock immediately. You can correct the acidosis, correct all of that stuff, and then extract the clock. Other options are on the table if you have time. Now, if you're talking about a high-risk massive embolism, then I think surgery is the answer in that situation. Now, not all patients with massive pulmonary embolism are in a situation where you don't have time. There are patients that you do have time on whose blood pressure may be 90 for 15 minutes, but they're not necessarily crashing on you. And you have time in those, and I think in some situations, thrombolysis is not a bad option. So, um, yeah, Sam. Uh, sometimes I think uh, non-surgeons wait too long uh, to refer the patients to the cardiac surgeons, thinking that uh, there's something to be gained with adding one, two, or even three presser agents. And meanwhile, the patients develop multi-system organ failure which makes survival and recovery from the surgery more difficult. I think in terms of the second part of your question, which is mortality, I think it depends on the condition of the patient going into the operating room. We've done 45 patients here now. In five years, we've lost two. Now, not all of them were massive, you know, so that includes some submassive patients as well. But the point being that if the patient is relatively reasonable going into the operating room, a very small chance that you're going to lose them. So, you know, in the literature, it's quoted as about a 20% mortality rate associated with that. Sam, today at noon, you quoted a much lower mortality rate at the Brigham. 
Um, Lewis, do you, do you um, send people to surgery with mass CPE or do you treat them with thrombolysis? I picked a seat at the end because we pulmonologists have always been the, the odd man out. Um, we were, as non-surgeons, slow to be in, in, invasive, both for thrombolytics and for surgery. I think the pulmonary community has been resistant. Watching over the last 25 years of my own practice, we saw mortality rates of 20 to 25 percent early on, and I think a lot of that was too late, too little, and um, then we had thrombolysis, and we've embraced that, uh, and I still think there's a subgroup of patients that it is also too late, too little, and as the mortality has dropped down, I think in part because of earlier referral, but also in part because of better anesthesia, better surgical techniques, I think the number is much lower in our hands. We certainly have the data. Actually, my colleagues now at the ATS today demonstrating our data uh, in terms of the morbidity and mortality of this procedure. And I feel very comfortable now uh, looking at a patient in a very dynamic way who has massive pulmonary embolism deciding on either lytic therapy or surgery. And I think a lot of it has to do with their, what's going on with their comorbidities as to which pathway we choose. Okay, so, so we've just discussed the non-controversial part of pulmonary embolism. I think, you know, there's not much disagreement that if you have a massive PE that you either take them to surgery or you give thrombolysis. But the area that there's still a lot of controversy is this area of submassive PE. And I was looking back at some of the older literature from the early 1990s, early 2000s, and that same controversy that existed then has existed up until this day. Um, in any given hospital, there's still um, a lot of disagreement among us on how the patient should best be treated. So let's just address the issue of um, intravenous thrombolytic therapy for submassive PE. Just for definition, submassive PE is they're hemodynamically stable but you have an abnormality on echocardiography with RV dilatation or dysfunction, or you have elevated biomarkers like uh, brain natriuretic peptide, troponin, etc. So they're stable right now, but the right heart is under a lot of strain. So where do we stand with intravenous thrombolytic therapy? Because Sam, in 1993 or something, you published an 18-patient study um, comparing TPA with heparin, looking at right ventricular dysfunction, and showed that RV dysfunction recovered twice as often in people receiving thrombolytic therapy versus heparin. And I think you were a big advocate of thrombolytic, intravenous thrombolytic therapy at that time. Where do you stand now? Well, I think uh, submass, the reason the subject is so controversial is because submassive pulmonary embolism is a very wide range of patients. There are healthy patients with submassive pulmonary embolism who will do great on anticoagulation alone. And then there are very ill patients with submassive pulmonary embolism. You know, traditionally, uh, we've tended to use the blood pressure as a cutoff, and if the patient's systolic blood pressure is 91 millimeters of mercury, we've called it submassive pulmonary embolism. Uh, and if it's 89 millimeters of mercury, massive pulmonary embolism. But that's probably not the best way uh, for us to think about this and uh, integrate everything we know. It's more a combination of the degree of right ventricular dilatation, right ventricular dysfunction, uh, also my, right ventricular micro, right ventricular microinfarction with a um, elevated troponin level, and also on top of that, the, the clinical appearance of the patient. Some patients just. Uh, are otherwise have an excellent, uh, have an excellent um, clinical appearance, and the, also the extent of the pulmonary embolism anatomically, all these factors, and the comorbidities. So, you know, in the ICRPR registry, you, you cited some 
really uh, terrible uh, outcomes for people with RV dysfunction. The in-hospital mortality was twice as much. The two-week mortality was double in people um, with RV dysfunction. So why is there such a reluctance to administer thrombolytic therapy if 1.5% are going to develop an intracranial hemorrhage versus a in-hospital mortality of 10%? It seems like there's, you know, the answer sh should be very easy to make. Lewis, how, how would you, I know that we've had some disagreements on whether or not thrombolysis should be administered. I think you always are in the camp that you don't want to do it, and I usually am in the camp that you do want to do it. Whatever you say, I say the opposite. Okay, so, so tell me about this. You have a, you have a mortality rate of 20% in the hospital if you've RV dysfunction. You have an intracranial bleed rate of 1 to 2%. But it's not clear that the mortality rate is they're dying of their pulmonary emboli. So are there other indicators that go into that mortality? Are there a sicker patient population? Um, so it's been very difficult to just do that math and say it works out that, gee, you know, you're going to save 9% to 10% of the lives here by giving thrombolytics. Sorry. Um, so I think you do have to weigh the intracranial hemorrhage risk. It is significant. The Pathos study showed us that. The interesting thing about the Pathos study, which was before that, was always we didn't have enough numbers, correct? So we had surrogates. We had VQ scans. We had pulmonary angiograms. We had echoes. Thrombolysis fixed all of that, made, everything, made the VQs better, made the PA grams better, made the echoes better, made the pulmonary artery pressures better, but had no impact on mortality. Then we get to 1,000 patients. And so now, finally, we've got the holy grail of the right number and no mortality benefit. So I think that's why I'm hesitant a little bit about, you know, who do we thrombolyze? We use it often. Um, also encouraged by the Moppet trial, where, where we're, again, dealing with pulmonologists. Again, my population seems different than the cardiac. That's always been our, our discussion was that pulmonary, people get PEs are usually a sicker population in terms of thrombolytic therapy than what cardiologists see. So our intracranial hemorrhage rates will always seem higher. So I think that's a lot of the hesitation that you get from us in the pulmonary community when we talk about thrombolytics. And the MOPIT maybe buys us, although data wasn't convincing, that maybe it's a safer way to go and still get systemic therapy. Sam, did I hear you correctly at noon that you said there was a meta-analysis that did show a mortality benefit because... Yes, that, that was published in JAMA, and Michael Jaff was the senior author. Uh, so there is, there is actually, if you pull all the randomized controlled trials, there's a mortality reduction with thrombolysis as opposed to heparin alone in patients with submassive pulmonary embolism. Now, uh, to your point, Lewis, I agree with you that overall the mortality rate for pulmonary embolism and our medical treatment of pulmonary embolism is much better than it was in the 1990s when the data for ICAPUR were collected. So I don't think that uh, we have those same absolute numbers that Jeff quoted uh, in the current era, but I do think that the, the relative increase in risk of death is probably similar to what it was in ICAPER with a much higher risk of death relative to baseline if there's right ventricular dysfunction. So I'm a little confused here because there's a meta-analysis published in the Journal of Thrombosis and Hemostasis late last year with the exact same studies that were in the JAMA paper that did not show a mortality benefit. So which one of these are correct? It's the same studies, the exact same number of patients, and one comes out with a mortality benefit and one doesn't. What do you think? I'll let Bobby answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I was confused, too. All right, well. If you notice, I didn't quote the meta-analysis for just that reason. We stuck with the randomized trial. So, Bobby, you have submassive PE. You have right ventricular dysfunction. The blood pressure is normal. When are you ever going to give th systemic thrombolytic therapy? 
And if so, when? Don't worry, Rob, we're getting to you in a minute, okay? Because <laughs> this systemic thing is on its last leg. Well, I think the, so the ESC this past year came out with an updated guidelines, and I think the way they risk stratify the patients is interesting, and I like the way they do it. They look at people uh, not only with RV dysfunction, um, well, they stratify people into intermediate risk, intermediate high risk, and intermediate low risk, and they base that ba um, on a combination of either having just biomarkers positive, such as BNP elevation, troponin, uh, heart type fatty acid, as well as RV dysfunction. And if they have both positive, then they're in the intermediate high risk, and they recommend considering uh, giving some sort of uh, advanced therapy as, a, as opposed to intermediate low risk, in which uh, maybe anticoagulation would be better. Well, what about this? You don't give it to anyone, but if they need escalation of therapy, then you give it. Because that's what the two largest randomized trials showed, that there was no mortality benefit, but the endpoint that was met was that those receiving thrombolytic therapy had less need for escalation of therapy. So if we, if we just waited for that, is that a reasonable way to address this problem if we're going to do systemic thrombolysis? I guess it's difficult to determine who will need, um, who will ultimately clinically deteriorate. And I think that's where these multidisciplinary teams are important. I think uh, getting people from different specialties get together to determine what the best uh, thing is for that particular patient. And, and I think, Jeff, it really depends on the rate of, of uh, decompensation. If there is a nice and slow uh, decompensation, you know, during the hours from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, <coughs> Uh, excluding Monday holidays, I think it's a, it's, a good, it's a good approach. But I will tell you that in real life, uh, that usually isn't the case. Unfortunately, the, the um, decompensation tends to be uh, very uh, difficult to detect at first. And uh, it tends to occur at the most inconvenient time. Rob, do you think um, we should not be giving systemic thrombolysis anymore because of the advances that have been made in catheter-directed approaches? So um, I think that the topic or the techniques of treating submassive PE with catheter-based skills is truly in evolution, and, and I would encourage everyone to think back on the treatment for deep vein thrombosis or uh, acute arterial stroke. Um, if, if we all remember, even as recently as 10 or 15 years ago, we evolved slowly from systemic thrombolysis for the treatment of stroke or the treatment of DVT into catheter-directed thrombolysis, which is probably where we're resting right now with submassive pulmonary embolism. And now there have been multiple studies uh, in DVT. Sam was just on the executive committee on the most recent NHLBI study, the ATTRACT study, uh, which uh, randomized straight anticoagulation to pharmacomechanical thrombectomy uh, for uh, DVT because it was widely established that catheter-directed thrombolysis wasn't enough, that we needed to have uh, mechanical techniques to debulk the clot rapidly to decrease the amount of lytic agent a patient received, decrease the bleeding rate, and to try and make this procedure a one-stop uh, uh, visit to an interventional lab to have the DVT treated. We've also seen recently in the last six months or nine months four randomized trials suggesting that mechanical thrombectomy in the treatment of acute stroke in addition to local administration of TPA is having positive outcomes in the treatment of, uh, of stroke, and it's widely become standard of care even at this institution. And so I see now submassive pulmonary embolism. We, we've all become somewhat accustomed, as the rest of the country has, with catheter-directed thrombolysis. As the mechanical tools become more refined and we're able to treat these patients in a, in a single visit to a cath lab or, or, an, or an operating room or, or an interventional suite and mechanically aspirate the clot, debulk the clot, and give a very, very localized bolus of TPA 
into the pulmonary arteries, I, I clearly we're going to see a dramatic improvement in the bleeding complications and the overall safety of the. Yeah, you're patient. getting a little ahead of yourself. So is the answer yes or no? Yes. We're not going to use systemic thrombolysis anymore. I think w I think we are rapidly moving towards a um, adoption of catheter-based techniques for submassive PE. Uh, and again, based on the analogies I've, I've seen, I don't think anybody in this room would give systemic TPA for acute DVT. I don't think anybody would give systemic TPA for acute stroke. And we are rapidly approaching the time when I don't think anybody uh, that treats or sees submassive PE is going to give uh, systemic TPA. Okay. Um, we're going to come back to that in a, in a minute or two. What, is there any role for surgery? You had mentioned, Rome, about doing surgery on submassive PE. Why would you do surgery on those patients? The most important reason to do surgery on them is uh, contraindications to thrombolysis. Um, most of these patients with submassive PE can be handled either with anticoagulation alone or with thrombolysis. There are patients that, you know, just because the blood pressure is 100, the patient's heart rate is 120. You know, the patient's on the tip of, you know, decompensating. Now, these patients are high-risk submassive, and they have the biomarkers are positive. The, uh, if you want to look at, uh, I guess, the only data that's, uh, that's out there between surgery and thrombolysis would look at the RB to LV ratio, and the cut point being about 1.5. Anything less than 1.5, they seem to do okay with thrombolysis. About 1.5, they seem to do better with surgery. And that would probably be the only reason to operate on somebody in that situation. Do the uh, medical um, physicians on the panel refer to surgeons for submassive PE? Lewis, you first, and Sam. Do you refer for submassive PE for surgery? Yes. The, the, the answer is, um, for the reasons you alluded to in terms of escalation of therapy for thrombolytics, <clears throat> we don't know where these patients are going to take us. I usually tell my fellows that if I'm talking to the patient, they've survived this PE. It's really what's going to happen in the next 24, 48 hours. And since we don't know, we involve the entire team for just the reason that if there is an escalation, a need for escalation, would that either be TPA if we've decided not to give it at the beginning or perhaps go to surgery. Um, the problem with the escalation um, algorithm is they may get sick very quickly. And unless your surgeon is standing in the wings ready to go, it may be too little too late with thrombolytics. And then we're right back to the mortality data of 20 years ago, where we're sending basically people who are an extremist to the OR. So I think the answer is they should be involved very early on, and RPE teams do do that. And then it's the dynamic uh, interaction over the next 24 to 48 hours between the medical person, the interventional radiologist, and the surgeon. Sam, you agree with that? So I also refer patients with submassive pulmonary embolism to our cardiac surgery colleagues, and these tend to be patients at the high end of severity who are at the border zone uh, between submassive and massive. They almost always have very dilated right ventricles. They tend to be patients who are too sick to really be able to anticipate a prolonged stay in the interventional or cardiac cath lab for a, a catheter-directed thrombolysis procedure. And they often have a lot of comorbidities where, which make uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis uh, a little less suitable. Uh, for instance, they might have uh, some degree of chronic kidney disease where we don't want to stress them with further contrast agent above the uh, contrast they receive for their diagnostic chest CT scan. Okay, so um, you guys have made a good point for when to consider surgery for these people. Let's go back to catheter-directed techniques because I remember about 10 years ago there were a number of reports of all these ways of doing fragmentation and they report two cases and they did very well and we didn't really have that experience here. There, there's several relatively large trials by PE standards um, that have been published recently. The ultimate trial on circulation um, screened 363 patients with pulmonary embolism and
excluded 304 of them from the trial, and then randomized 59 patients. And they were randomized to either ultrasound, uh, assisted catheter-related techniques, or to heparin, standard heparin therapy. So there are 30 people in one group, 27 in the other, that were available for follow-up. And the primary endpoint of this study was a change in the RV to LV ratio. Why are we using RV to LV ratios as primary endpoints in studies to prove that catheter-directed techniques are beneficial? Uh, well, that's a surrogate endpoint because we don't have the uh, massive number of patients that would be needed to have a primary uh, mortality reduction endpoint. I mean, it seems like a pretty weak endpoint to to make me convinced that um, that this is a good technique when the RV may return to normal, you know, at 30 days or 60 days anyway. They, they you know, they tend to be. And patients, as Ram said, where they, they have such, such uh, large, weakly functioning right ventricles that they almost never uh, return to normal. So, Rob, what are you doing now? Are you like, uh, there's this ultrasound assisted device, the Echoes device. Um, everybody is really hot on this device. Sam talked about it today. Um, does it add anything? And when you take somebody down to do a catheter technique, exactly what are you doing and what kind of results are you getting? So the ultrasound technique, I think that the, the, the trial you just referenced, the Ultima trial, uh, essentially what they did, they used a proprietary technology to infuse low dose uh, Ultaplace uh, over about 16 to 18 hours, the total dose that the patients received was uh, approximately 24 milligrams of Alteplase over that uh, time period. And what they found, as uh, Jeff mentioned, was a, a reduction of the uh, RV to LV uh, ratio. Uh, and in the cohort that was randomized to catheterization, they found uh, marked reductions in the uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressure, the mean pulmonary artery uh, pressure, and a number of other right heart indices. Uh, another article that was just released in CHEST, which was the perfect registry that uh, Dr. Kalina uh, referenced, was a multi-center uh, prospective registry looking at both ultrasound accelerated thrombolysis and standard non-technology based catheter directed thrombolysis or the cheap way, that's the sort of uh, you know, way I'm going to refer to it. Um, and they found no difference in the outcomes whatsoever. So if these patients got catheter-directed thrombolysis, again, approximately 24 milligrams of Alteplase administered over 18 hours through a catheter without ultrasound probes on it, they also saw a, st a statistically significant reduction in the systolic pulmonary artery pressure, the mean pulmonary artery pressure, the right ventricular pressure, the RV to LV ratio, et cetera. That's the only evidence we have so far that this additional ultrasound-based technology or the expensive technology, you know, really doesn't make any difference whatsoever. We have not chosen to adopt that technology here because we don't feel it's evidence-based, so we're using the less expensive technology. We've performed uh, that protocol where we're administering a, approximately 24 milligrams of Alteplase over about 18 uh, hours or so in a monitor intensive care unit, and we've seen, on average, a, a 25 to 30 milligram reduction in the pulmonary artery systolic pressure in the patients that we've seen. Now, do you um, have catheters in each pulmonary important. artery? Yes, we have catheters in, uh, in each of the pulmonary arteries. Typically, we have not chosen to uh, employ this technique for unilateral pulmonary uh, embolism yet. Um, the sort of standard patients that we're uh, referred for this specific technique is a submassive patient with uh, moderate to severe right ventricular strain on echo, echo uh, cardiography, an estimated PA pressure above 45 with positive biomarkers, as you alluded to, either brain natriuretic uh, peptide or positive troponin. Almost universally, these patients have EKG changes suggestive of right ventricular strain. Uh, and we typically will perform bilateral catheter-directed therapies with infusion of a very low-dose 
of uh, Alta Place, as I, as I mentioned, about 24, 25. So I remember a few years ago, there were a few patients who decompensated on the IR table. Has that, is, is that happening still? Because for a while, um, you guys were a little gun shy about doing percutaneous procedures. So the, 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 those cases specifically were using one of the more aggressive uh, thrombectomy systems, which is interestingly enough, one of the thrombectomy systems that was employed in the recent NHLBI uh, a track trial looking at deep vein thrombosis. So essentially, uh, operators were, were taking a device that was designed for the femoral vein or the iliac vein and placing it within the right heart. And essentially what many operators found is that the more that you use this very powerful device, it led to adverse uh, events, including bradyarrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias, massive hemolysis. Um, and I, th I think broadly now, at least across the country, and maybe even globally, there's been a recognition that this particular thrombectomy system is not ideally suited for the right heart. Uh, a number of uh, medical device manufacturers are currently developing technologies specifically suited for the right heart, but they really have not reached commercialization yet. So uh, there's another uh, study, the Seattle. Greg, I think, presented the Seattle. Is it a registry, or you want to tell us about that? Uh, Seattle, too, is a one-arm uh, trial where uniform dose of TPA in a uniform protocol was used in patients with submassive or massive pulmonary embolism where the primary endpoint was reduction in right ventricular to left ventricular uh, ratio on the CT scan. And, and what were the results? Well, I think the most powerful result was the safety. There were zero intracranial hemorrhages and the, there was about a 25% reduction in the uh, RV to LV ratio at the 48-hour time point. Have there been any intracranial hemorrhages in any of these catheter-based um, studies that have been published in the last several years? To, to my knowledge, there have been uh, half a dozen studies uh, published in the literature in the last 24 months. None have reported an intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, there have been af over, over a, a total cohort of uh, somewhere between 150 and 180 patients, I think two major bleeds. Uh, and so reproducibly, series after series, there, there appears to be a very, very strong tendency towards uh, high degrees of safety and low adverse events. So in the absence of chronic kidney disease or um, is there a reason not to consider doing this in people who have submassive PE? Lewis, what do you think? We now have a, a treatment where you don't get intracranial bleeds, so we don't have to worry about that. Well, as everyone in this panel knows, you know, chasing surrogates is very dangerous. So we, and this is 30 year history of chasing these surrogate markers for mortality and morbidity. Um, having framed it that way, um, I don't think we understand completely the effects of anesthesia in this patient population. Um, and so we take people who we deem sick enough that they need advanced therapies, but not so sick that they should get s surgery. And then we bring them to a pseudo operating room and then we begin to do an invasive procedure with or without anesthesia. And I think anesthesia uh, has been a stress test for us in that we have found patients who move quickly from being stable to not stable. Um, so I think we need to define that group a little bit better, have a, have, have a little better understanding if we're going to send people routinely for catheter-based therapies, either we decide they shouldn't have anesthesia or if they're going to have anesthesia, we, we need to be able to identify the population at risk. Sam? <clears throat> uh, I don't think we're at the point where we want to abandon systemic thrombolysis completely. I think the type of patient who's ideal for systemic thrombolysis is the type of patient who doesn't necessarily come to an academic tertiary referral center, but there are many young patients without uh, any comorbidities uh, who present with massive pulmonary embolism, and I think in them the risk of major hemorrhage is very low, 
And the advantage of uh, systemic thrombolytic therapy is that it can be administered quickly uh, without any specialized equipment. So I, I think it does deserve a place in our toolkit, a place in our armamentarium, and we're, we're more likely uh, to use it in where we have an unselected patient population. Okay, I want to uh, go on to another topic. Uh, for the next 10 minutes or so, I want to um, talk about IVC filters, then we'll open it up to the audience. But, um, and have you guys talk about the PE response team as well a after we're done with this. But I, I want to talk about IVC filters because there are a lot of IVC filters being placed um, for indications that are very, very soft. The data until recently was fairly confusing. Um, for example, Sam, one of your papers from 2006 in circulation um, looked at mortality and cardiovascular mortality. This is from the ICAPER registry of those who had IVC filters placed and those who didn't, and there was a mortality of like 50% in those who did not have a filter placed, and it was 10% in those that did, recognizing it's small numbers of patients. But then there was the paper that you showed today um, by Stein, published in the American Journal of Medicine in 2012, which looked at over 2 million patients in the United States. And it looked at those who were stable and received thrombolytic therapy. They had improved mortality. Mortality was three times higher in those who did not get a filter. Those who were unstable and lytic therapy, the mortality was two and a half times greater in those who didn't have a filter. And those who were unstable and did not get um, lytic therapy, and mortality was one and a half times higher in those that didn't get a filter. Now, granted, these are observational studies. Just recently in April, um, the PREPIC-2 study was published in JAMA, which suggests that IVC filters confer no benefit at all and perhaps some harm. So let's start at that end of the table because I think you're an IVC filter guy. And we'll come to this end of the table and see if Robert's an IVC filter guy. You know, my daughter tells me I'm too old to change, but that's not true. <clears throat> um, I used to know what to do here, but uh, certainly over the last two years, my thinking about filters has changed. Uh, in fact, the way I got to filter the thinking is, again, going back to the idea that the patient is not going to die of the PE that's in front of me. They're going to die of their recurrent or the next PE. And if you couldn't thrombolyze them, I somehow use that rationale to justify the placement of an IVC filter, which became an even easier decision when we had retrievable filters. So it became a very easy answer to say, let's put a retrievable filter in, pull it in three months, and everybody go home. Um, there was a, I think there's faultiness in that logic. Um, and now I'm migrating away that I'm going to at least take two breaths before I ask for a filter um, based on the PREP2 data. Okay. Um, Ram, how about you? Does everybody get a filter who you do surgery on? Yeah. Everybody that we operate on gets a filter. In fact, uh, we do it in the operating room through the atrium. Um, we had a patient early in the series that uh, we operated on, did well for the first 24 hours, then got into trouble again, we repeated the scans. The patient now had a re-embolization. The clot in the IVC had now completely disappeared. So ever since then, we have gone to a policy of putting a filter in every single patient on the operating table. Rob, you get asked to put a lot of filters in. What do you do when you don't think they're indicated? Do you put them in? No. Um, really? Really not. Uh, you know, the, the, to, to echo Lou's point, when retrievable filters were introduced to the market, I think everyone initially um, breathed a sigh of relief that they had an option to make them sleep easier at night. Uh, and there was a uh, liberal adoption of that technology. Unfortunately, for those of us that put them in and are asked to take them out, uh, we've seen this technology um, really rear its ugly head, so to speak. And we've seen 
these devices that we are told are safe by the Food and Drug Administration migrate to places that they aren't supposed to be, cause uh, local and remote vascular injury as a result of these devices fracturing and fragmenting and embolizing across the, the right heart circulation. Uh, causing local areas of uh, either vascular damage or damage to the surrounding organs, uh, even in the worst circumstances re requiring an open laparotomy to retrieve these devices. Uh, so I, I have uh, developed a very, very high threshold to put them in. Specifically for, for the cohorts we're talking about here, I, I am one of the you know, broad uh, believers that in a, in a, in a massive PE cohort, where they are at um, continued risk until they go home, I, I think there's clearly benefit for this uh, technology. What the role is for a submassive cohort, I don't think we have an evidence base yet. I certainly think PREPIC2 moves us away from the liberal use of retrieval IVC filters for this population, but I think there's gonna need to be a lot, of, a lot more um, evidence-based uh, uh, work done to, uh, to guide our choices. Sam, you get the last word on this filter thing, and um, today you discussed the guidelines for when a filter should be placed. Would you go over those again? And would you tell me how PREPIC2 has affected your thinking on filters? Okay, so uh, the guidelines that I spoke about at the noon lecture uh, were from the American Heart Association in 2011, and they were for patients who had a contraindication to anticoagulation or patients who had suffered recurrent pulmonary embolism despite anticoagulation or uh, for um, consideration in patients with massive pulmonary embolism even if they could tolerate anticoagulation. I uh, think that uh, what a group of us tried to do is uh, work with Paul Stein, who you mentioned, and we submitted a, a grant proposal to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute to study filter placement in patients with submassive pulmonary embolism in a randomized controlled trial. and. Um, this trial that we submitted, I think the budget was about 20 or $25 million. The, the study itself got a very high score on a scientific basis, but there clearly was not enough funding available to carry out such a trial. As for PrEP2, I don't understand the biology of the results of PrEP2 that you could uh, insert filters and not have the filters mostly prevent uh, pulmonary embolism. Okay, um, I'm, we're gonna take questions in one minute. Do one of you three guys on that end wanna tell us about the P response team that we have at Sinai? Um, the position champion here has been Human Poor, who uh, I guess about a year ago began the discussion of having a multidisciplinary team uh, of pulmonary critical care, interventional radiology, cardiology, and cardiac surgery to begin to and, and vascular medicine, and did you forget that? Okay. Cardiology, vascular medicine, sorry. You know, but that's why I picked this under the table. Um, <laughs> to begin to have basically pillow talk about this topic, where the way we've discussed this topic now in a live fashion, mobilize a team, usually through one of these subspecialty arms, you could either call the pulmonary fellow, uh, since a lot of these patients are presumably sick and are being evaluated by a medical intensive care unit, but routes of access can also be through <clears throat> cardiac surgery, vascular medicine, cardiology. Um, you can call any of the, the fellows there who would then contact um, the team uh, and we would begin discussion uh, and a member of each team would assemble at the bedside, evaluate the patient from their perspective, from their point of view, uh, and then hopefully help uh, the referring team to come to some conclusion about a very difficult topic. Um, it's live. It's done through text and at the bedside, um, and it's available as a 24-hour 
seventh ser uh, service, and it's quite dynamic. Uh, I think of a case where the three of us were in a room at the bedside, and within the course of an hour, the discussion went from no therapy to thrombolytics to catheter-based, and the patient wound up in the OR, all within an hour. So uh, the beauty of that is everyone was at the patient's bedside, in the wings, discussing it, and was able to really mobilize very quickly. Uh, I think that's the beauty of the team. It's also shared decision making in this medical litigious climate. Yeah, this is uh, happening nationally. There's a lot of interest in this area. Let's open it up. Anyone have any questions or comments? Marianne. trauma-based versus anti-cardiolipin antibody, because I think that would make a difference in outcomes. You, you mean in PREPIC-2, is that what you're talking about, or not really? Um, you know, it was a randomized trial, so everything equaled out. Because the need for long-term anticoagulation in someone who has a coagulopathy might be uh, different in, in your judgment and decision-making process. So if I have someone who has you know, large PE has DVTs and uh, anticardiolipin antibody syndrome, and it's going to be at risk on lots of airplane flights going around the country, I might be more inclined to keep a filter in place, as opposed to someone who had a, a, a ankle surgery, you know, it's a one-time issue. That cuts both ways, though, right? Because you have the increased risk of um, venous thrombosis in that group of patients as well. So I've talked out of both sides of my mouth in terms of trying to decide whether I put a filter in or not. Because yes, I would have some comfort in that you have a, a belt and suspenders approach with anticoagulation and a filter, but you are buying an increased venous thrombosis risk with the filters as well. So I'm not sure which way to go when you look at that patient population. If you looked at PREPIC-1, I mean, they were protected initially, but then they had a much higher DVT rate afterwards in, in the long run. The, the long-term data from PREPIC-2 isn't available yet, right? right. So that, 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 that might end up being one of the endpoints in the midterm or the long-term from that study. Other questions? Yeah. Comment on the new anticoagulants and how long, the new anticoagulants versus warfarin, and how long do you keep the people on anticoagulation? Sam, you talked about this today. This is probably one of the most controversial areas. Well, the, the novel oral anticoagulants have at least as good efficacy as warfarin, and all of the pivotal trials show that the newer anticoagulants are considerably safer than warfarin. All four of the FDA recently approved anticoagulants have a decrease in intracranial hemorrhage rate in the order of 50 or 60 percent compared with warfarin. As to how long you continue a patient on anticoagulation, uh, the current guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology suggest it should be for a very extended duration if the patient has an unprovoked or idiopathic venous thromboembolism and is at low bleeding risk. So are you treating any PEs as an outpatient? Um, the New England Journal paper on outpatient management of pulmonary embolism if they have a low PESI score, or is anybody doing that? Uh, we're doing it here, actually, as part of our algorithm through the PE team. The, everyone gets a PESI score, and if they fall into a low-risk group, we we'll actually will, again, have to be individualized for the patient, <clears throat> we'll send some people home with outpatient therapy for PE. So that's part of our algorithm in the PE team. Do you uh, treat first with heparin before you go to the novel anticoagulants? Uh, if the anticoagulant we choose is the bigotran or doxaban, we treat for five days with either low molecular weight heparin or heparin or fondaparinox, and then abruptly switch. But, but the other ones, uh, rivaroxaban and apixaban, you would just start without heparin or an injectable. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Dr. Fuster. Hmm. No, there is a question that 
It's quite often, I don't know the answer. Actually, we had some controversy recently with you, actually, in a patient. You have an eight-hour ride in a plane. You go to Moscow, and you arrive there, and you develop a pulmonary emboli within the first 12 hours of arrival. And the question is how long it takes to be suspicious, because this is not uncommon, that the pulmonary embolus may occur within a very short period of time on a plane ride like this. We, we just had a patient, actually, Jeff and I, and we had a discussion about it. So in other words, um, there, there, there was one paper on the prevalence of pulmonary embolism at Charles de Gaulle Airport. This was a while ago. I forget what it was. It was incredibly low. But Sam, do you think within that time period? Well, uh, Dari Mozafarian wrote a paper showing in the Annals of Internal Medicine basically a dose response curve that the longer he calculated the hour by hour rate of new pulmonary embolism. Uh, and I think I think it is. I think it. I think it probably is the longer you're doing the long haul flight, the more likely it is to develop a pulmonary embolism. As for the uh, de Gaulle Airport paper that was in the New England Journal, I think the chance was one, in, it turned out to be about one in a, one million. I think it was even more than that. But I, it's important because was this a provoked PE or an unprovoked PE? That was the issue with us. and. But what would you consider? Well, provoked? I think that I think in general uh, we classify these uh, long haul flight uh, pulmonary emboli as unprovoked and idiopathic because uh, there are so many other people who can tolerate the long haul uh, travel without developing thrombosis. They've been they've been traditionally placed uh, in the bin of unprovoked. In idiopathic, and, and they certainly can. Those p individuals certainly have that type of extended risk over a decade of follow-up. Any other questions before we end? I have a question for Dr. Goldhaber. It's sort of a loaded question, but um, since we're all working on submassive PE without the appropriate evidence base, what? will be the next trial? What are we going to have to look forward to in terms of answering these questions? When should care be escalated? Um, what will be the next paradigm? Should patients get IVC filters? <clears throat> well, the, the next information we'll have is a subset of 700 of the 1,000 patients in Pytho uh, who've been followed for two years now and they've been followed for the endpoint of developing chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. I believe those data will be presented at the American Heart Association this coming November. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for coming and thank everyone on the panel for participating.